Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For you who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pension. Our guest today is Fiona Stewart from the World Bank. She has also worked at OECD, and I would think that most of you in the call actually know Fiona because she's been working with almost any pension system in the world. And if there's a pension system she doesn't know, it's probably not worth knowing. Fiona, it's a pleasure to have you here today. My pleasure, Stefan. Thank you. And before we, we get going on the questions, I think a message for all of you in the audience. Please write down your questions to Fiona in the chat. And Fiona and I will have a conversation going into a couple of topics. And if you say, ah, I want to know more about this, I, can I, I want to ask Fiona about that, type it down immediately in the chat. And then I'm going to pick it up with Fiona after our conversation. So Fiona, before we start, we have a tradition here that previous speaker can ask uh, the next speaker a question. And Nick Barr has a question for you, Fiona. And instead of me repeating it, uh, let's roll the tape. Investment in human capital raises a worker's productivity, hence their earnings, hence their capacity to save for their pension. But in developing economies, human capital investment is constrained by a country's taxable capacity. And to make things worse, tax financed higher education tends to be hijacked by the better off. Now, a good system of income contingent loans simultaneously relaxes the fiscal constraint and reduces the regressivity of finance and hence makes it possible for workers to invest more easily in their human capital. But what's always bamboozled me is how you implement income contingent loans effectively in a country with limited institutional capacity. So my question is, do you have any whiz bang suggestions I can steal? Oh, Professor Barr, um, never asks you easy questions, does he? So I think my answer to Nick would be, um, I would take it more broadly. And I think what he's asking, I think, is something that we've been thinking a lot about is how you think about pensions in emerging markets. You need to think about them in the round. So it's very hard to tell people to lock their money away for 30, 40 years in the future when you need to for development today. So um, thinking about how we link and, and also how you do that in, in, in countries with low formal uh, labor markets. So linking the short-term benefits to the longer-term savings, I think is a really a powerful mechanism that we're beginning to try to, to fit together. So that might be linking pension savings to loans in some way, maybe for, for, for education as, as, as Nick is implying, or say for housing. And you can do that for using your pension savings as sort of collateral for a loan. Or um, some of the countries, one of the countries that we're working in to think about how if you have um, build up a savings pot, um, that could actually count as part of your credit um, score, if you like, and allow you access to sort of standardized cheaper credit. So I think Nick's question is, a, is actually a bigger one than, than, than just the student loans. And um, I'm sure we'll get to some of those, uh, those concepts as we go forward, Stefan. Thank you, Fiona. And I think it's a good idea when we talk about sustainability. And for me, there's like two angles to it, the sustainability of the pension system itself and the sustainability of, of how we invest the money that are sort of put aside for retirement. So I think we can start with the first one, because for me, pension in itself is the big S in ESG, it's social infrastructure. It's really there to help people have an income also later in life. And We've seen the COVID has been pretty much a stress test of the pension system across the world. And Fiona, when you have looked at the different systems, what, what are your observations and comments? Yeah, so I think, um, as you say, the stress test for a, certainly a DC systems has been, has been very big in the last few years. And I've sort of been calling it the pensions pandemic paradox, if you like, because on the one hand, completely understandably, um, during the, the COVID crisis, um, people needed access to their savings and often pensions are the biggest financial assets people have for really emergency short term needs. Um, and the, the issue is balancing that with keeping the savings. We also saw at the same time just how important our long term savings are and are going to be for 
um, the Build Back Better, uh, the infrastructure investment, et cetera, that we need coming out of the pandemic and also linking to the sort of green, uh, green uh, low carbon transition in their economies. Um, and so we saw on the one hand, you know, the, the Nordic uh, investment banks issuing COVID bonds, which the pensions bought, um, uh, CDBQ in Canada um, uh, issuing bonds that supported the local economy, et cetera. So that long-term finance and the financing was really important. But on the other hand, some short-term access in most systems was allowed, understandably, but some systems we really saw the floodgates open. And for what started with emergency needs becoming um, really sort of a political agenda to uh, allow people, we all want access to our savings today. That's why we lock them away because we know that we have to save and it's, it's, it's difficult for us to do in behavioral economic terms. Um, and so it's always politically popular to allow people access to their money. And so Chile is the, the ultimate example. We all talk about Chile, uh, pension geeks, as you say, we all talk about Chile a lot. Um, and during 2020, there was initially um, allowing emergency access to the funds, which uh, was understandable in, in the first round. Then there was a second round of access later on in 2020 to the pension funds in Chile. Then there was a third round of access allowed in 2021, um, coming up to the election. Fortunately, the recently the parliament's actually stopped a fourth round, but that started to get way beyond the emergency needs. We actually saw about a quarter of the pension savings, $50 billion being taken out of the system, 20% of GDP. So it really has put a big dent into the decades worth of savings that the Chileans really put into their system, um, has really taken a big hit and almost half the accounts were actually taken down to zero. So really it's gonna be difficult to rebuild. We understand there's a lot of political pressure on the system around before the COVID 2019, um, although the, 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 the pension system in Chile has, hasn't performed too badly in terms of the actual pension funds, it hasn't been terribly popular because people, the, the, the contribution rate's been quite low. And so you haven't necessarily got as much out as people were expecting from the system. So it's been this emergency access has been a way to really start to undermine the system. So it's a very case, a test case for how you really need to be careful and balance the short-term access and needs with this really precious pot of long-term savings we all need to build back better in future. Thank you, Fiona. And another stress test, which is not perhaps related to the pandemic, but is how do we deal with self-employed? Because they tend to fall between the cracks in the different pension systems. And in the Western world, I think most countries are struggling with how to solve it. What, what are your... What, what can you see in other countries uh, that sort of haven't have had this problem for a longer time with a la large proportion of the workers not being in, in sort of traditional employment? It's a huge challenge. I mean, the coverage is a, is a big issue in the countries we work in where, you know, 80 percent or so of the labor market is informal. Doesn't necessarily mean this is the, the poorest of the poor and the, you know, the real social protection for the lowest income workers will always be needed sort of cash transfers from the government. This is the sort of layer above of self-employed, you have your own business, you have a store or a, you know, a workshop or whatever, people who have some income, but it's just not through a formal payroll. And it's really difficult. And where we've seen, I think, best traction for this is in countries where you've had more of a national scheme, because as we all know, you know, pensions is a scale game. And particularly with lower income workers, you really have to get low cost administration to make your savings work. And countries like India, where they've used the actual, the civil service pension administration, which of course is a huge scale in India, gives you a really, really low cost base. And from that, they then um, uh, had a pension system that anyone can join. And uh, it's gone through, there's a lot of local banks, there's a little local bank on every corner in India. So it can go through the local banks or through digital finance, um, we know the, uh, the digital um, uh, registrations, et cetera, are amazing in India, which has really opened up access. And so this, uh, the APY system um, for the informal sector workers, um, either through the bank account or through the digital accounts, there's 20, 30 million now, I think, in this. So not huge in terms of the overall scale of India, but it's really starting to scale. Um, and 
Rwanda has a national scheme that they've issued, which is, is, is getting up to a million people and growing. We're working on one at the moment with the treasury in Kenya. So these national schemes, keeping it low cost, using digital and local access points, and then behavioral finance to try and keep people saving. Getting people in is one thing, and the mobile money, the mobile access can do that. Keeping you paying regularly is challenging. And there's nudges, behavioral economics, we can do that through top-ups, through, um, um, uh, through uh, nudges, through uh, mo uh, um, messaging, um, et cetera. Using these sort of techniques, we're starting to get there. We haven't cracked it totally, but we are starting to get there. And I think there's actually interesting lessons back for the developed economies. And again, how we get people through non-payroll routes, maybe linking to consumption rather than income. And there might be some lesson there for, for example, Sweden, who has the premium pension, which is for, open for everyone who works in Sweden, and to make sort of an addition to that where self-employed can actually do that to get the scale. Absolutely. I think that's a very good example. Exactly. It's using that sort of admin base that you have and then tweaking it so that the, the scheme um, is more... Uh, well suited to people who may not have such a regular income so you don't have to have the same contribution every time it could go up or down um it may be as i say you go through through your bank account and just when you have excess you know a little bit of savings there there's an automatic push back into your into your pension savings account these sorts of techniques but i think that's a very good example of using like the ppm framework which is there can keep the costs and can and, and can piggyback off what you already have yeah, so I think the fun part is you can learn a lot by looking at different countries in different parts of the world because problems you might have in one country already exist in another one and they find a solution. Um, I was wondering, to go back to your answer on Nick, you said they might be looking at it a broader way than just uh, student loans or just pensions. And I know you've been looking also into countries like Singapore, who has another system where you, which is much broader saving. Perhaps you can give some insights from there. Yeah, so the, 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 we've been looking at the, the, so Asia has what they call these provident funds, which is broader than just, it's usually a package. So you have um, a savings component for, for, for pensions for longer term, but then they may also have healthcare, famously in Singapore provident fund, they have housing as well. And um, the, the challenge is when you have a big central scheme that you know the governance is always a huge challenge, of course. Um, and some of them in the region are better run than others, absolutely. Um, some have seen a very you know, interesting journey over the years, like the Employment Employers Provident Fund, the EPF in Malaysia, which we did a study on. But I think it's this idea of the, the combination, as, as I was saying with, with Nick is implying, that we need to think about, particularly as our, our lifestyles are changing, as you know, we're coming out of the pandemic and we're working differently. This idea of having you know, your third of, as Nick has talks about, I know, a third of your life in uh, employment, uh, in, in education, then a third in employment, then a third in retirement. It's not gonna work like that, this 100 year life idea going forward. We might have some education, work for a bit, take a sabbatical. I have younger colleagues who are moving to other parts of the world or the country and working from there and then coming back. And you know, we're having a very different structure. And as we get older, doing a little bit of work and a little bit of retirement. How do we think about in the round of, of how we meet the needs through our life? So um, my, my idea is that we need to think less about the, the pension pillars that the bank's been talking about, it always in the past, and more about a pagoda, that you have a really strong central beam of social protection that we will need through our lives. It might be for the, for the younger and the elderly in society, the most vulnerable, but when we're unemployed or other points, that's got to be there and you, you can design that in different ways in different countries, whether it's a universal basic pension or income or there's different ways to design that. And then you hang sort of savings pillars off that more flexibly. So a little bit more flexibility on the way in and a little bit more flexibility on the way out as well. And then that allows us to, when we have um, some savings, uh, if we know, for example, we're going to take a sabbatical in a year's time, Maybe we put a little bit more in because we know we're going to have a break from our savings. Or if we come back, then maybe we add up a little bit more. We, we top up again. So why should we have the same contribution through all our lives, for example? Maybe at some point we're paying off the student debt, as, as Nick implied. So you'd have a little bit of a lower contribution then, but maybe up it in future. 
a bit like this save more tomorrow um, concept that um, is used by a lot of pension funds in the US. So I think sort of really thinking about pensions more holistically as part of the needs of our life, I think is where we're going to have to go going forward. And I think with a, with a lot of new technology, make it possible as well, right? So in the past, it was very difficult to, to do flexibility, but now we have the technology, we have the means, we have the ideas. So I think we're going to see a lot of happenings or, or a lot of action in this area. I was thinking if we would move on to on the investment side, because you mentioned in the beginning that you know, there's been a lot of bonds issued by the governments uh, for, for uh, sort of social bonds in order to deal with the pandemic. But also I was thinking, when you're thinking about making our economy or, or you know, the system more sustainable, have you seen anywhere where the pension funds are part of sort of a circular economy that the pension funds invest in the local economy, they create jobs, they create growth, more people are paying into the pension fund. So the money are part of sort of lifting the local society. Is that something you see or is it more like an utopia among academics? No, I don't think so. I think that's very much again in emerging markets is where you can you can see this. There's this this philosophy, I think, in some of the the very particularly the big public pension funds and the provident funds, actually, in some of the emerging markets. So in South Africa is a good example. The government employees pension fund, the GPF, which is the, the biggest pension fund in South Africa and the civil service pension fund. And they have had they've been very early. Um, some of your listeners may know um, Elias Masalela, who's someone I would hope totally recommend for your podcast. Elias is completely um, visionary when it comes to pensions and savings. And he's always he was one of the earliest um, concepts of this universal owners and really thinking about long, long term savings and really thinking about pensions as long term. And they've always had this philosophy that you have an overall target pensions are there to pay your pension and um, you have an overall target return for the portfolio. But about 85% of the South African pension fund, by law, has to be invested in South Africa. So if the South African economy doesn't develop, you're not going to get the returns for the rest of your portfolio. So they take a small percentage, a small part of their portfolio, and they really use it for impact for local development into affordable housing, um, Black economic empowerment projects, etc. Um, it's it's been I think a little mixed I think we can say and there's been some changes in the in the in the methodologies but the concept I think is a very strong one. Another one I would point to again is I mentioned the EPF in Malaysia. They were hugely influential in developing the local bond market. Um, the the local pension fund played a really strong role in bond market development and um, being there with the, as the long term um, showing that they had appetite. Um, and um, infrastructure bonds, et cetera, were created because the EPF was signaling it had this long-term demand. So I think there are very good examples in the emerging markets um, where really, and often it comes down to people, but really visionary leaders of these um, public large pots of domestic money really show the difference that they can make. And this is a lesson, I think, for many countries in the Western world that you might actually get a bit more out if you're Use your influence and, and the size to actually trying to do something in, in, in nearer home than just going for the global markets? I think it's a mixture, I would say. So um, take the, the GIPF, the big um, elephant of the pension fund world in Japan, whereas, you know, the last um, a while ago we had Hiro Mizuno, I'm sure, again, someone else would be very good for you to talk to, um, has a, he was the, the CIO and had a very visionary, again, this really long term view. and um, did a, a, a lot in terms of um, the, the concept of ESG into the GPIF fund. That had a huge impact in Japan, in Asia, and globally. I think it really did start to you know, really change the awareness of, of the long-term view and how ESG can come into pensions. So it can be local, but I think these big public funds, the universal owners, are not just universal in terms of their own economy, but actually are very big, important parts of the capital globally. And I think maybe we, we don't think about them on a universal global basis or link them up or get them talking to each other enough. And maybe that's another role. I think uh, we're seeing a lot of these sort of partnerships starting to come through post pandemic, more institutional investor platforms and partnerships. And I think that's hugely exciting and encouraging. 
Yeah, that's what's super fascinating. When, when I think about the discussion around, I say the energy transition and all the investment that has to be done around that, I, I kind of come back to, I think you were at OSD back then, there was always this discussion about, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be made, and that's long-term investments. The governments have no money, and they're like insurance companies and pension funds with long investment horizons. So there seemed to be like a perfect match there, but very little happened over the years. So what were the hurdles, and what, what do we need to think about going forward to make this happen? Because the energy transition needs to happen quickly. What are the lessons to be learned? So, so it's difficult. I mean, I don't think there's nothing happening. I think I think it has been moving. So the big leaders, whether it's the, the Australians, the Canadians who've um, been in the infrastructure space, it takes a long time. It's It takes time to develop that expertise. Um, but they have really quite significant percentages of their funds now in infrastructure, actually. So the leaders are leading and really quite significant amounts of their funds in these sort of real assets. We are actually starting to work with, in emerging markets, some of the local investors. So for example, in Kenya, some of the, the, the funds, the, the public pension funds in Kenya have formed a consortium called KEPFIC, a local pension fund consortium to invest in infrastructure and local assets. But they're, they're too small on their own. They don't have the, the scale to really build that up like the big Canadian funds. So they've come together to do that. And we've provided them with, and um, some of our colleagues from the US pension funds um, have a network and they have come to Kenya to help explain how they have invested in infrastructure, but they don't know the African markets. The Kenyans know the African local markets, but they don't know the infrastructure asset class. So it's been a very fruitful discussion across. And we've seen the uh, US pension funds invest about, I think we're up to about a billion now in, in African wide um, funds. And the pension funds in Kenya have just invested in their first infrastructure project, a road toll road project. So it is happening. It's heavy lifting. Um, to really get people to understand the asset class and to develop the pipeline, as we always know, is always a supply issue on the pipeline side. So it, putting the pieces of the jigsaw together is not easy, but I do think it is happening. I'm thinking, you said before that we need to have, to solve the sustainability of the pension system, we need sort of low cost efficient solutions, but also when, when you're going to invest and then you're in that sort of situation where they sort of, sort of heavy price pressure, people often end up investing in, in the index funds or close to index investments. How can you sort of, how do you do long term when you're basically pushed in under the cost constraint? And how do you sort of, how do you push it to the next level? Given so that again, I think it's about an overall portfolio approach. It's like, where are you going to, you know, spend your assets, uh, your investment asset? Um, fees where are you going to sort of spend your 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 capacity and um i think um some of the bigger funds uh nest i think is a good example actually in the uk that's done you know a lot of sort of passive on one side and then decided to, to where to really move out into other asset classes our own pension fund i'm actually the staff representative on the world bank pension fund board and we do a lot of you know, passive in the big markets but then actually do quite a lot of private market investment and that's where um our pension fund team really spend spend their investment um, fees and, and spend their time is is there. So I think you can think of it almost almost like a barbell approach, if you like, of, of really where it's difficult to add value and where you need just the scale, then the passive index can be a very important part of a portfolio. But these sort of other asset classes can then really add on top of that. So it's a it's a an overall mixed approach, I think, a balanced approach. You're thinking of the sort of you're like a global universal owner in, in the sort of one part of the portfolio, and then you focus more on impact and in the other part of the portfolio. Is that how yeah, you do it? Yeah, that's right. I think that's, 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 that can be part of the story, definitely. So thinking about impact, by the way, we, when we spoke in, before the webinar, we're thinking like, you know, tradition is like risk return, but also impact is now coming as a, as a third factor when you're looking at investments. What's your... Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I thought that was a very interesting part. Yes, no, I think this is the next sort of stage that we're really getting to. And I think more and more we're hearing, I love like the, 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 the uh, Make My Money Matter campaign the guys in the UK are doing and so forth. People really want to know, what is my money doing? Where is it going? And funds, I think, really do, particularly things like 
with these net zero commitments, how are my portfolio, how is my investment really contributing to my net zero target? I have many portfolios now have. So I think this risk return and impact as a third measure is a hugely interesting idea. One way I think maybe to catalyze that is through where we're seeing the movement from like um, uh, green bonds, label bonds, which is previously use of proceeds. Now we also want to see well, what is the impact of that investment. So we're not just saying, you know, what my, my, my green bond is going into a, you know, renewable energy, but it's actually going to create, you know, this much GHG reduction, or if it's a social bond, this number of schools and et cetera. So, and we in the developed, we know this in the developed world, this is what the, the World Bank's always done. We've always had this sort of impact measures for how we lend and how we operate as a bank. And I think it's really interesting that these concepts are coming across and these sort of KPI performance linked instruments, I think is a really interesting trend that's really coming in 2022 and going out these sustainability linked bonds and loans. So as I say, you actually can change the cost of capital based on measurable outcomes. So I think that's a hugely interesting trend um, that I think we'll see a lot more of going forward. Fiona, you mentioned the, the Japanese bank and you, you said they have a very long investment horizon and they, they basically changed the mentality, right, from being relatively short term to long term. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, and I think we've done some a lot of sort of studies of some of these, 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 these systems of change and a lot of it comes from individuals, actually. I think the Canadian pension funds we've looked at, too, it's, it's very interesting that we all think of the Canadian pension funds as being you know, some of the big gold stars and leaders globally. But if you look back you know, 15, 20 years, they weren't necessary. They were sitting in government bonds. They had a lot of, several of them had big investment issues and, 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 and problems. And it really was a change at the top, a philosophy that came in and started to say, though, if we invest long term, um, you start to see the returns improve. You start to see the confidence build. And you get this sort of, positive circle this like you know virtuous circle that starts to come through and getting the governance right the leadership right really then starting to diversify the portfolios and it, it can really be a very very um you know dramatic change you can see in these funds but a lot of it comes from from the top from leadership from vision and from governance but i think we have good examples where where that has been put in place but the epf in malaysia i've mentioned a couple of times which is another one i think you could see a lot of change in over the years yeah, I remember Keith Ambach here was here on a previous webinar and he talked warmly about the Canadian model and also it's quite an expensive model, but net of cost, it, it generates quite good return as well, according to Keith's research. So it's been well worth the effort. And I remember I had a conversation with Claude Lemieux. He was sort of the, the one who took Ontario teachers from being the sleepy born yes. investors to what they are today. Yes. And I asked him a bit of a question. So what would you do if you were in the shoes of a more European pension fund where you have constraints on, on how much you can charge and you have constraints on the on the uh, salaries you can pay to the people working in there? And he very candidly responded, that I wouldn't take the job. So I thought that was kind of a fun answer. But I'm not going to give you that easy way out. So my idea here is if you are, assuming you become in charge of a master trust somewhere, you have the freedom to do things. What are the things you would do to increase the impact of, of the investments in such as? Well, I think, as I say, back to this idea that um, you, you have a, a balance in the portfolio. So where do you want to, where are you, you know, just using it passively, doing it as, as low cost as possible? Where do you want to really use your skills and focus? Where can you really add value? And then this part of the portfolio that you might really want to focus on impact and it's, it can be a small part of the portfolio i think some of the london pension funds have like one percent of their portfolio going into local impact projects um, so i think it's it's been very clear what your overall strategy is but where you can add value and where you're going to sort of really focus your resources and where you're going to take this um, slightly different impact approach that is almost like i almost like to think of it like systemic risk management in that you know we will pay a pension fund will pay whatever 10 basis points to hedge against the decline in the US stock market well why would you not take 10 basis points if you're a universal owner of the pension system and climate change is going to really affect the global economy and therefore your portfolio 
why would you not take 10 basis points and put that into a global public goods fund that might protect the Amazon or some of the other key global public goods that are going to be so important in our fight against climate change. Thinking of things differently, thinking of it in sort of, you know, not necessarily philanthropy and why should I give up return? This is systemic risk that we all need to manage. So maybe thinking of it differently and flipping the way we think about these things is, is, is important going forward. So buying a climate change insurance, you're paying insurance yes. premium, and then by actually buying up a little bit of a rainforest. Why not? Yeah, sounds like a cool idea. Fiona, we have uh, a lot of questions waiting for us in the, in the chat. So let's start with the first one. As well as permitting temporary withdrawals during COVID, uh, as in Chile, but also Kosovo, on which uh, Bernard Casey is working on, there have been suggestions for temporary suspensions of contributions. What's your view on that? It's another way. We saw that in a few countries as another way to do it, particularly where um, with the occupational pensions. So Kosovo is obviously a central system, but where you know employers was, were struggling with the COVID, particularly in some sectors. So sort of forcing to pay long-term savings rather than you know losing workers today. Um, it's again, it's always a balance. It's another option. Um, the difficulty I think we saw in some of the, the Eastern European countries where you, you reduce the contribution, it's always kind of hard to get it back up again. So it's always this, how do you keep it temporary and how do you, you then, then get back to normal is a challenge, but it's been, um, it's been another, it was used in several countries um, um, as, a, as an emergency measure. Thank you. And we have another question from Bernard as well. How can DC funds, where savers can switch providers and portfolios, invest in the long-term non-quoted illiquid funds? And to do the long-term investing, such as infrastructure, I think what he's trying to say there is basically, how can you really be long-term if you're in a situation where the money can move away quickly in your fund? Yeah, so switching, it's been a challenge, and this is again something in the sort of studies in, in, in Chile where the, 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 the switching was, uh, was harmful actually to, to individuals were not, not switching at the right time. So how you manage switching can be very important. I think um, uh, Mexico, for example, have put sort of interesting ways that you only switch certain times a year. Um, uh, so you can allow some choice, but manage that choice is one way to sort of prevent this immediate in and out and in and out. And what you saw in Chile was, um, although it wasn't that big a percentage of the portfolio, because the funds were so concerned about the switching that they were holding a lot more liquid, liquid than they actually needed. So it actually has bigger knock-on effects than even the actual amounts coming in and out. So there are ways to manage switching within systems. Um, even the sort of, again, the behavior economics, you can even tweaking the admin to make it a little bit harder not stopping people, but just making it a little bit harder to switch can actually be useful. Um, so there's ways to manage the switching. Um, and I think this it's not necessarily, I think there's a follow-on question, I think, on, on um, Australia. And, 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 you know, Australia is a DC system and there is no choice, but they have been very long-term investors. So um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, DC systems can go into long-term investments and go into infrastructure, et cetera. But I think managing the switching and managing therefore giving the, 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 the funds the confidence to be able to put at least some of their portfolio away for the longer term um, I mean, is a way to do it. The question he had there was basically, well, a lot of these assets are not mark to market. So the valuation is subjective when you want to switch. So if you have an infrastructure project, it's probably sort of appraisal based rather than market value based and some of the assets are valuable. How do you deal with that sort of valuation imperfection? Well, yeah, and this is a, it is a challenge, of course, for, for any sort of non-listed asset, but, you know, the, the, the Australians have been doing it, the, the IFM um, funds have been doing it for many years, the real estate assets, you know, we, we have mechanisms for doing this, so it isn't perfect, and if it gets to a large percentage of your fund, it can be more challenging, but, um, you know, there are ways of managing this, I think, when it's a, a relatively uh, a relatively controllable percentage of your fund that is manageable, and we have seen, as I say, the DC funds do this. Yeah, and... and I have an experience when I looked at the Swedish market, by the way, there, a lot of the traditional life insurance companies selling a sort of variable annuity, they have quite long term, while the people who are selling unit link funds, 
they basically are very let's say just holding listed assets this also seemed to be even if you're dc it's the way how you organize and implement it that sort of differs what you can and cannot do or perhaps it's in the head of the people running the, the different products absolutely yes no it's true definitely Here's from Nsumo Mutuko. He says, one of the challenges in developing countries is that the pension funds seek to invest in sustainable assets. They are not able to get credible or independent assessments of the actual sustainability of uh, companies they seek to invest in. How can we support pension funds to be able to assess sustainability of potential investments? Um, hi, Nsumo, good to hear from Nsumo. Um, yes, I think that that is a challenge, and that's why I think things like the, you know, the, the green bonds are quite interesting because they have a framework um, where of, for reporting, and then you have third party um, assessors um, of that reporting. And I think it's actually improving over time. By the way, the, the, the sort of the green bond frameworks and principles, you know, I think they are actually getting tighter, and 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 and, and we're we're all growing. You know, the third party assessment pool is getting bigger. So I think that's an interesting way, maybe rather than going sort of into direct assets where it's, it's harder to measure. If you go through an instrument like a, like a green bond, for example, you have a framework there, you have a measurement and a reporting framework um, and a third party that can do that for you. So that's one way to give the sort of confidence of, I think, certainly the emerging market pension funds who don't necessarily have that capacity themselves. Um, there are ways to, to go through and do that. Also, there's things like uh, IFC, a, a sister organization, private sector organization. They have a sort of co-investment platform um, called the MCPP, Managed Co-Investment -co Platform, where some of the, the insurance companies will go into a project um, with the IFC because they know the IFC, who is hugely experienced in emerging markets and has you know, the gold standards in terms of um, environmental and social um, uh, um, safeguards, et cetera, for, the, for their investments. Going alongside like that can also be another way to give confidence, maybe for the, the bigger funds, but it's another sort of, I think these sort of co-investment ideas are growing internationally, which are also, I think, an interesting way. And I think it's a good thing is a lot of the larger schemes are now also talking to each other, right? Because yes. people are doing very similar things. So it's a lot of experience to learn from each other. So I think talking to each other about what you've done and what you've learned is really important because is if other people have done the mistakes, you don't have to repeat them. So it's cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes than from your own. Exactly. And that's why both, I think, England and Chile can help the world a lot. And that aside, uh, there's a question here on the value of impact. What is the value of impact? And what does it do for my pension? So someone with a sort of more focused, I, I want as much pension as possible, how will impact help me get there? Or is this something I have to give up in order to sort of as an insurance for, for climate change? How would you sort of address this more conventional mindset that says, what does it do for my pension? So I think there's the there's the, certainly the, 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 the risk side and we're realizing that a lot of these issues are um, material risks for investments, particularly long-term investments like pensions. So we have to look at um, uh, new types of risk, the climate, et cetera, we have to start to look at this as, as part of the risk management for a fund. So it's not necessarily giving up longer, you know, shorter term returns, but it's actually thinking about really the longer term management on the risk side. So that's part of it. But then I think there's also a desire um, by, by um, some members of pension funds to say they, some members will give up a little bit of return for specific um, issues or causes or, 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 or opportunities. Um, and uh, that's why we're seeing, I think, a lot of differentiation coming through. Um, uh, within portfolios, you may be given a choice and there may be a sort of specific um, impact kind of choice within your pension fund. Um, that in particularly, I think, younger members of the fund, I'm certainly seeing that with a, a staff association, um, that the younger members want to have that choice. They want to be given that. And Yes, they want to get a return, but they also want to see that. And if that means maybe a slightly slow, uh, lower return in the short term, they, they will. Some, some will take that. So I think it's a question of long term risk management. But I think it's also a, a question of back to this sort of customization and choice as well. 
it's important how you frame it i think for people to understand it and yes i i personally i i am very open and warm to the idea that you reinvest in society where you are so yes. that your your pension money is put back to work where you are and creating this circular more local approach to it because you feel you're you're getting something more than just the return but you're part of the whole whole economy yes david bird has a question here are there any learnings from the rest of the world that could improve the uk pension savings so i think um this i think one of the questions i think the the auto enrollment has been super interesting in the uk and has really improved the coverage particularly of the um formal sector but some of these, I think, interesting behavioural economic ideas around how you get um, self-employed and people who aren't in you know, the formal payroll in. I think some of those could be very interesting for the UK to explore. Um, and as say, this sort of idea of gig workers or coming in and out, less structured employment. I think many of some of these ideas could be, could be interesting for the UK. I was talking recently to a fascinating professor out of Tel Aviv, um, Iris Sobel, and she's been doing some really interesting work on fintech and longevity. Um, so I think there's maybe some interesting lessons developing in other countries, um, particularly like sort of Israel on the fintech edge, um, that maybe could help with cracking that sort of one of the final sort of pieces of the puzzle in the UK, which is uh, sort of self-employed and, and um, less sort of uh, formal um, work, workforce in the UK about how to get them coverage and how to nudge them into saving more. Well, another problem I think in the UK is it's well, well thought out up until you retire, but then it's sort of not so thought out anymore. So what are your sort of views on countries who solve the retirement phase or life after full time work, as Don Esra would call it? So, I mean, the countries that we work in, um, it's, it's difficult because there's not really annuity markets. Um, there's no very underdeveloped insurance markets as well. Um, so it can be difficult to really, you know, um, um, build annuity markets in all of the countries that we work in. So either I think a sort of well-designed program withdrawal, it's kind of, you know, 80-20, it can get you, it's not everything, but it can get you quite a long way there. Or in some countries you actually have um, the, the, the government back as a sort of central annuity provider. I think some of the Latin American countries do that. Um, actually, the, the CPF in Singapore actually also is, um, provides some annuities. So maybe central provision and maybe maybe well-designed program withdrawals, it gets you a long way there. Um, and maybe that as a default is what sometimes that we, we sort of um, recommend and use in more emerging markets. And also in emer many emerging markets, the, the state pension is basically a, a lifelong inflation linked annuity, right? So yes, you have it depends, a basic of course. standpoint. Yeah, it depends. If you look at again the system as a whole, what's uh, what are you getting from your public side, and what do you what is your occupation or private pension doing as a top up? That's right. I think let's go back to your uh, your idea with the propaganda that you have a central strong thing in the middle, and that's the government, who sort of has a good social security, and then you build solutions around it. And depending which country you're in, workplace pension is a complement to what the state pension is or isn't and uh, i think when you look in the, i look a lot in netherlands and sweden and, and the uk and i think there the, the 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 public system is pretty good so the idea with the workplace pension is to say how can i complement it how can i get sort of a good overall solution but i assume in many other countries they don't have that luxury right so then you have to do more yourself that's right so or or um, in, in, in Asia, where you have the provident funds, and that really is, um, you know, there's quite a high contributions going in, and they're giving you a range of benefits, but that can be, um, there's less need in some countries where you have quite a high public system, if you like, um, there's less need for sort of occupational pensions. In, in some countries in the Francophone world, we don't have the same sort of history of a lot of it is, is you know, where are you starting from? So in quite a lot of the francophone countries, it can be the insurance companies, it can be sort of assurance fee, the life insurance is much more of a, a natural product. It's not exactly a pension, of course, but it's more that the savings mechanisms, the longer term savings mechanisms might come more out of the insurance world, where that's better known, um, is more part of the financial architecture in some countries. Um, so it's, it, 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 you know, we're not all starting from the same 
point. Um, it can be uh, it can be different different starting points and therefore different solutions. Another question from David here. It says, "Do you see Collective DC having a large role in future pension provision?" I think he's not still thinking about UK, but kind of globally. So it's interesting, David. I think it's not it's not a concept that's taken on. I think massively in other countries. I'm not seeing it in other countries hugely yet. Um, whether it will, I don't know. I don't have a strong view on that, actually. But no, it's not something I've seen discussed a lot in emerging markets yet. Although it's interesting, you could say, because a lot of emerging markets that we work in, and Zomo obviously will know this very well in Kenya, that you have these in, informal sector savings groups, the, you know, the, the Chamas and the Sacos, and you, know, you actually have saving circles, the sort of microfinance world in, in, in Bangladesh and so forth. So the idea of collective savings is actually really kind of in the DNA in a lot of countries that we work in. Whether you could take that and sort of formalize that a little bit more and take it into longer term savings is quite an interesting question, but um, it's not actually something we've seen a lot yet, but uh, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a million miles away from, from some of the sort of financial sector in, in some of the countries we work in. Question that I have, Fiona, is like, when, when you've been looking at all these different countries, particularly the, the developing markets, is there something you, you said, wow, this was really clever and it's so different from the way we do it in the Western world? What, what is the stuff that has sort of stood out to you and say, this is something we definitely would learn from and then look at it. And, and it could be pension, it could be you know, how, how we deal with the sort of aging. What is sort of the, the wow factor you had when looking around? So um, I think some of the, I think it's so, it's very interesting, again, as Nzomo knows with, uh, you know, Kenya and the Mpesa and, and India and the, 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 the digital IDs and so forth. I mean, some of the leapfrogging that's gone on in the financial inclusion and the financial access through the digital products has been, there have been big wows, I would say, um, out of, of India and, and Kenya and countries, which is, which is super exciting. So I think really that sort of, leapfrogging of, of, of financial fintech world um, has really been impressive in, in, in some of the countries we work in. I think it's been harnessed more for um, maybe credit and maybe um, uh, banking to date. I think it's been less um, deployed in savings and particularly in pensions. I think there's a lot more we could do. But um, I think some of the definitely some of the the, the wows on the on the fintech side are coming out of of of, of a really interesting um, bunch of countries, definitely. And I think it's actually quite understandable that it's happening there because I know some people they working with fintech is really difficult to get distribution because the market is sort of already there in in, in for example UK, while if you're in India or Kenya can really solve a problem there's no other solution in place so they have a they have the right place to be uh, bernard came back to a question he wanted to hear more about and he said the canadian and australian funds they don't mostly invest in green but brown infrastructure who bears the construction risk also and look at the south african example it has been it had special underpinning from the state yeah, so a lot of today, as you say, a lot of it's been um, brown infra assets. Again, I think in the emerging markets, um, we've seen, uh, again, there's a more, maybe maybe that's a leapfrogging, but where there's more um, green infrastructure need. So that's where a lot of the, the work we do sometimes in sort of the, 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 the blended finance or the different types of instruments. So again, I'm thinking of um, India where they have these in um, infra investment, like in, like infrastructure REITs, for example, um, which can sort of um, do rollover assets into um, special vehicles created then for the, the CDBQ and the local um, life insurance companies have invested in. Um, sometimes um, the uh, it can be through uh, the, the local uh, infrastructure banks issuing bonds, which the pension funds buy, and then the local infrastructure bank is the one that's taking more of the construction risk but it's through the sort of infrastructure bonds that they're issuing that the pension funds come in. 
Um, and again, sometimes we've worked uh, IFC colleagues, it might be green infrastructure, but there's a, a, a first loss or a blended finance um, element to the, the projects that we do, where we're also trying to sort of crowd in and work with some um, international investors as well. So yes, I think to date, it's most of the, the, the traditional um, bulk of the portfolios from the, the, the Canadians and the Australians has been in brownfield. I think in the emerging markets, there's also more of a greenfield need, but it has to be through more vehicles and or sort of blended finance instruments to do that. Um, I mean, if you go back to, you know, the, the Chile's of this world, when uh, the, the original kind of, you know, a while ago now before the financial crisis and before the monolines, there were some greenfield investments in, 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 in some of the infrastructure in Latin America, where again, you had an insurance mechanism. So um, it can be done, um, but I think it's a question of getting the right vehicle to do that. So you know, you're basically saying if the, in the developed world, if the governments would bring, sort of take some of the project risk in a lot of the green infrastructure, that might actually create a boom of investment coming that way from pension funds. Again, it's back to the theory. It would be nice. Again, we've seen it in some examples. Um, it's difficult to do. Um, yeah. And so we haven't necessarily seen the sort of scale or replication we would like, but it's it's not impossible. Sounds good. One, well, we have asked you, Fiona, a lot of questions today. So maybe it's time for you to ask a question. And our next guest is Will Sandbrook from the Nest Insights team. I know you know him well. He's going to come here on June 9 at 2 p.m. And we're going to talk about lessons from the sidecar and all the other interesting research they have done. What is the question you would like to ask Will? So um, I would love to ask Will uh, what we've been talking about in terms of the self-employed. Um, I think that's one of the challenges in the UK. Um, and I know it's something Nest has been looking at and they're always a very innovative fund. So I'd love to hear about the, the innovative ideas Again, these sort of behavioral economics ideas, linking savings to consumption rather than income, et cetera. What's the Nest team up to? And what are you thinking about in terms of how to get the, the, the self-employed um, into, into pension savings? Thank you, Fiona. We will make sure that we'll get the question. And you're welcome to tune in on the next episode of Pioneer Pension and hear him answering your question. And I also would like to thank everybody in the audience for participating in this webinar and asking your questions. And as you know, this will be available afterwards as a recording and you can ask your friends if you find this interesting to have a look at it. But most importantly, Fiona, thank you for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. It's been great. I really enjoyed it today. And I hope I'll see you again soon, preferably in the real world. Indeed, I hope. One. Very much looking forward to lots of sort of friends and names on the chat as well. So it'd be lovely to see everyone in person before too long, I hope. But thanks for the invite, Stefan, and I really enjoying the podcast and I'll listen to more in future. Thank you.